certainly smiling here. I just uploaded my review for Doctor Strange 2, and now we're here to talk about the backlash to a WrestleMania that we talked about and the build-up to a backlash that's the build-up to a WrestleMania that we just watched. It's the the WrestleMania, the backlash is what it is. You get me, Tomas? And if you can't get enough of this WrestleMania is going into backlash as well, don't you worry, everybody. This Sunday is WrestleMania backlash for WWE, which is highlighted by a six-man tag match with no titles on the line. It's so fucking We're going to have redundant. fun talking about that. So We're going to have so much fun talking about that show. Oh, uh, we will. As we speak, as we speak, I do not know the full card for that show. I know the main event. I know Cody Rhodes and Seth Rollins. And I know... AJ no, and it. Edge. That's all I know. AJ, AJ and South Edge, thank you. Um, um, we also have Lashley and Omos in what's presumed to be another shitty match. Um, we also it have, wasn't a shitty match. It was a it, decent match. It totally was a shitty match, but you know what? We're all entitled to our own opinions. Uh, Charlotte versus so let's, and then I quit. That's right. I quit match. And, and then, then we can top it off with uh, Mad Cat Moss versus Happy Corbin, which is the real main event. I forgot about that match. Yeah. Tells you how forgettable <laughs> that show is going to be, uh, especially compared to Backlash 2001, which you guys voted in for us to talk about here on the retro uh, edition of the little z &T wrestling show we have going on here. Uh, smash that subscribe button if you're new. Hit that thumbs up as well if you enjoy all this wrestling nonsense over here. Um, and I'm sure Tomas is very, very happy. You can't exactly see him from uh, where we're all sitting, but uh, he's ready to torture me. He's ready to torture Absolutely. me. Absolutely. This matches. is this is the backlash, honestly, of gimmicks. Uh, there was a lot of gimmicks in this match. Yeah. And uh, this was – the best way to describe this was WWF was kind of transitioning into an experimental phase, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Stone Cold Steve Austin had just turned heel. He had just aligned himself with Vince McMahon, and he had just won the championship against The Rock. They had a rematch on Raw, as we'll get into later, in a steel in a cage. cage match. Yep. The Rock was leaving to go film Scorpion King, or was it Mummy Returns? Uh, I believe it was Scorpion King at that point. Mummy Returns Scorpion was King. out that summer, so uh, yeah. So yeah, he was off to film that movie. So with The Rock gone, with Austin heel, with no real big baby face, they took another big experimental phase where they aligned him with triple h who had just won the intercontinental title they're the intercontinental champion they're the wf champion they're being dubbed the two-man power trip so you already have one huge heel turn from wrestlemania and wwf is already jumping into this heel alliance yeah which was kind of a pseudo heel turn for triple h so a lot of experimental he was stuff already healed though he was already healed yeah but as uh, we'll talk about in the buildup, there was tease for Triple H being the face in this, but he ended up just aligning himself with Austin. Also, remember, WCW just got bought out a month prior, the week before WrestleMania. So we have all of those weird little pieces coming into this is an interesting show. This is an yeah. interesting time for WWF, but it's still a good time for the WWF because there mm -hmm. are a lot of good matches on this show. They were still selling out. I think JR said on commentary when the pyro went off for the 18th straight pay-per-view, which is nuts. You never hear Michael Cole say that these days because, well, WWE nope. unfortunately doesn't sell out their buildings anymore. Um, but can we talk well, real quick? So this is the direct follow-up to WrestleMania X7, which is the greatest pay-per-view of all time. Obviously, this doesn't hold a candle to Mania X7, but this was still a damn fun show taking place in the Rosemont Horizon, as it was known back then, in Chicago, Illinois. And this Backlash set, I mean, we talked about it, uh, I think, way back when we started the ZNT Wrestling Show, when we started the 2002 retrospective. This is an iconic look with the swinging arches and all that. Ugh. The they swinging blades. They don't make pay-per-view stuff like that anymore, and it's a damn no. shame because it's fucking lazy. I was like, I think by like 04 and 05, I was like scared of that blade. I would see that blade like in the promo of Backlash and be like, what kind of sadistic weapon of mass destruction is this thing? Or this that weapon of mass torture? That's like the sharpest, most jagged blade I've ever seen in my life. And By why God. is WWE in possession of it? <laughs> By God, what is that, Paul? It's a it's an arch swinging side like structure. <laughs> And we'll be talking about that yeah. a lot more. <laughs> it's an inside joke from the Survivor Series stream we just did. But, but uh, to open up this pay-per-view, let me ask you something. Are you ready to deal with the X Factor? I got everything I ever wanted, and I'm going to give that back. We yeah. talk about random tag teams on this channel. Are you ready for a random faction? 
It's the mm -hmm. X Factor. Remember the X Factor? It's X Pop. I it's do. Just Incredible, who just defected from ECW, and Albert, who again, who is in this revolving door of gimmicks. <laughs> Poor guy just can't seem to catch a break. <laughs> he used to be in TNA. Now he's a part of the X Factor. And they're taking on the Dudley Boys, all three Dudleys this time, in Bubba Ray, Devon, and Little Spike for good old fashioned six man tag team action. Mm hmm. A six man tag team match, Playa. Um, the X Factor, I mean, their theme music, I just got demonetized by singing the Uncle Cracker there. But uh, this is, I mean, this was a weird, weird phase where X Pac, who is a frequent sidekick to people like Shawn Michaels and Triple H. Now he's the leader and he's got perennial muscle head Albert and along with ECW defector, just incredible. And again, keep really in mind, WWF had no competition at this point. WCW is dead. So is ECW. So we have a bunch of, you know, ECW. I don't want to call them rejects, but uh, no uh, acquisitions is a better term because WWF yeah. bought all the contracts and even though they couldn't get every contract, they were going to take advantage of every contract they can get. Credible right. was one of them. And, you know, you saying that X-Pac went from being a part of D-Generation X, a faction to leading his own. It's really sad to say that the modern day equivalent would be Roderick Strong, poor guy who went oh. from being part of the Undisputed Era, who is now leading the Diamond Mine, but they won't stop releasing members of the Diamond Mine. And now Strong is asking for his release. Good on you. Mm -hmm. Get the hell out of there, Strong. Yeah, uh, that's beside the point. Mm -hmm. um, another topic for another time clearly once yeah, Roderick but, strong is the uh Roderick strong could be the joker in the owen hart cup but uh i don't know i don't know we'll see what happens there that, but off topic. back to a more relevant topic yeah, yeah. um x-pac had just come off of that very infamous feud with kane which honestly should have culminated at wrestlemania but it didn't but now mm -hmm. here he is now jumping from a tag team with kane to this faction, uh, yeah. there's not really much to say about this there faction. Been they don't a really little, accomplish like, much. There, there might have been a little lull for X-Pac in there, um, you know, in between his team with Kane. <clears throat> and, I think he went through like a whole – I think X-Pac went through a whole year um, of just being in mid-card purgatory, feuding with Chris yeah, Jericho, he, um, and now he's here leading his own faction, uh, becoming a light honestly, champion not too long after this. Again, this really doesn't do X-Pac, Credible, or Albert any favors. They're kind of just thrown together for the sake of being thrown together. Uh, the, the, again, the best thing they had going for them was their theme song at the time. But this was a fun way to start the show. I, I, I enjoyed this match a lot. Oh, it was, I did, too. Again, it was great six-man tag team action to you know, warm up the crowd. Fairly basic tag team action here uh, featuring the Dudley Boys, who are a perennial opening act for the World Wrestling Federation, I'm noticing. A lot of these openers that I'm I'm noticing the freaking Dudleys are in a lot of these openers that we're talking about on these old pay-per-views. These crowds loved the Dudley boys back then, and they were a perfect way to get the crowd like hyped up and ready for the rest of the show. Um, what surprised me was Devon was the one who took the heat through all this. It's very, very easy to have the little guy in there, Spike Dudley, yeah. and him getting beaten up by a big 350-pound Hip hop hippo, as he would become a year. I was going to say, you know, when you have the spot sponge and Spike Dudley in there, and he's not taking the heat, uh, oh. he's either taking a spot or he is honestly a living weapon for his brothers to uh, swing around like a baseball bat. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> big old, big old baseball bat. But uh, Devon is in there taking a lot of the a uh, lot of the heat. Bubba Ray Dudley, of course, gets the hot tag, hitting bionic elbows everywhere. I think he hit a bubble bomb fairly early on on uh, Just Incredible, which is a fun uh, fun play on words in that name, by the way, for PJ Polacco. Um, X-Pac and Just Incredible after the What's Up gimmick. He uh, Bubba misses a corner splash on X-Pac. Albert hits a corner splash on Bubba. Double super kick. That's it. That's the end of the match. X-Pac pins Bubba clean in the middle of the ring, but X-Factor is not done. They want to beat him down, and basically what happens is 3d through a table to send the crowd home happy hypothetically after an opener but i mean pretty basic nothing really wrong with the match but nothing too remarkable about it either two uh two and a this quarter was, two and a half maybe this was basically wf wwf going we have this new faction they kind of have to go over but you know the fans love the dudley so they're gonna take the l but they're still going to put people in tables you know we're still i like to say we're still in the attitude era at this point so yeah, give like the fans what they want. Right in know. the right in the twilight of the attitude era, if anything. But uh, 
not to use the terrible yeah, defend what they want, you know, something that WWE uh, doesn't do nowadays. Mm. So, uh, <laughs> give the people what they want. Yeah. You know, but, like, like, like Excalibur always says, give, you know, give the fans what they want. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh huh. I'm hoping, uh, I'm hoping the Duchess of Queensberry isn't what people want because she arrives at the arena and William Regal, the commissioner, is there to greet her. Um, such a kiss ass William Regal. He's like, you know, really playing to the Duchess here, uh, for a match that we'll be talking about in a bit that I know Tomas is ecstatic to talk about. Um, can't wait. Yeah, we also get a Kurt Angle interview with Lillian Garcia. Kurt basically says he owns Benoit since he beat him at WrestleMania. Even though the clock is going to show 30 minutes in that sub ultimate submission match, Benoit's in for the fight of his life. And then the line of the promo. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to shine my medals. Who says that? <laughs> Who says We're that? We're going to get into this. We're going to get into Who this Who shines their medals? Later, but Kurt Angle was on the way to wrestling the match of his life. And he was still going out of his way to make these little pot shots every chance he could at the announcer, at the crowd, as we'll get into later. But Angle must be the most focused wrestler on the planet if he's able to do that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He's able to multitask really well, clearly. But, oh, boy. Let's talk about a hidden gem here, Tomas. It's for the hardcore title. Rhino is defending against Raven. Two ECW acquisitions that we were just talking about. These two guys went out there and had a crazy wild weapons brawl that was very, very fun from the opening bell. And the thing that I really, really respected about this match specifically is that they weren't overly reliant on backstage brawling. You might notice that no. they were fighting outside the ring. They didn't take one step backstage. Not one. The hardcore title was a walking gimmick in the WWF and later mm -hmm. into the WWE. But this didn't feel like the gimmick that it was meant to be. There was no 24-7 rule. You didn't have a million jobbers running in there trying to steal the title. There wasn't a ton of interference. This was, dare I say, and I feel like I'm going to catch a lot of flack from old school ECW fans. And I'm an ECW fan myself, so hope I don't catch too much flack for saying this. <laughs> this was reminiscent of, I would even say, like an ECW TV title match. Yeah. Just two really solid ECW guys wrestling for a championship and taking advantage of the fact that ECW had no rules. It's honestly something that should have been more of a staple. And if they would have treated the hardcore title with a little more respect back in yeah. the days of, you know, Mick Foley and when, you know, even guys like Austin or Undertaker held the title, maybe it would not be considered such a joke because I'm sorry, I grew up in the era where the hardcore title was a precursor to the 24-7 title and it was treated yep. like a joke for the jobbers. Weapons and pinning each other in airports and parking lots. So to see, it, this was a nice breath of fresh air. To see kind of a, the closest WWE would get to an ECW style match kind right of on added, the clutch of the buyout. It added some prestige to the hardcore title that it never really had, which is kind of strange saying that because literally the hardcore championship belt was a piece of garbage, a winged Eagle replica a just beaten to shit. Um, but Rhino and Raven go out there and they just beat the fuck out of each other. This match was fucking violent. Like, I if had never anything, seen this thing. You know, <laughs> Raven and Rhino probably just pulled each other to the side like, hey, let's go do some ECW shit out there. And there was ECW shit for sure. Kendo sticks, trash cans, a grocery mm -hmm. cart, street signs, steel chairs, that honestly, was, everything under the sun. Except that was fire Raven's and gimmick, tanks. though, was the shopping cart. He brought out all those weird things like, you know, the weird Frankenstein Halloween, like, uh, <laughs> what, what you might call it? The Halloween decoration that you'd see in the front yes. yard. Like you put a picket <laughs> in the grass and like, that's how you decorate your front yard. Yeah. Raven had one yeah. of those. And he also literally was throwing everything, but the kitchen sink at Rhino and Jr. aptly calls it. Oh, he just hit Rhino with the kitchen sink lack apparatus there, which was a kid. Love sink. that. You know, also the baking sheets coming out. And again, the commentators <sighs> acting like they've never seen a baking sheet before in their life. Like, uh, what is that, King? I mean, I'm sorry. What is that, JR? Is that, is that a baking sheet? <laughs> <laughs> Paul Heyman this time. Is that a baking sheet? Oh, you're right. Oh, my God. Well, Paul Heyman right. was that, calling this that's match. Actually, you know? that, I, 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 that, 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 that I had a blonde moment there because <laughs> I was actually wanting to talk about that. How I really enjoyed Heyman and JR calling this pay-per-view. And oh, here I am yeah. making uh, Jerry the King Lawler impressions when he wasn't <laughs> even on the show. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we can still make J uh, Jerry Lawler impressions all we want for sure. But uh, fucking Rhino goes for the gore and he goes right through a fucking shopping cart. And it's like, 
good lord, that guy's got to have a fucking nasty well on his head. Somehow he wasn't bleeding. Um, there were some Sabu-like spots. They were running up the steel steps and hitting each other with clotheslines. This crowd was very into Raven as well. Raven was the white meat baby face. Like, JR, the only thing missing was JR saying, what a white meat baby face this guy is. Yeah, the you thing know? about Raven was, Raven was a success in ECW and ECW only. WCW and WWE acted like they had no idea how to book this guy when it was literally the easiest thing well, in the world. Well, the flock also appeared in ECW or WCW rather. So it's not like WCW was completely oblivious to Raven's success, but you're right. ECW was certainly where he shined brightest. The WWF really did not know what they had in Raven. Exactly. Um, and you can say what you want about the flock being a good faction for the time being, but ECW right Raven was crucifying Tommy Dreamer in barbed wire. Mm -hmm. Raven was I remember watching those matches like the the the, the staircase to heaven match with Tommy Dreamer and watching oh. Raven be the most deployable son of a bitch heel I've ever seen in my life. And they knew how to book this guy as a sheer main eventer. And just to mm -hmm. see WCW and WWF not capitalize on that success, it's a damn shame. But I'm glad Raven shined on this pay-per-view. Raven was amazing at promos. He knew how to get under your skin. Much like Jake the Snake Roberts back in the heyday, Raven reminded me a lot of him. Uh, WWF did not... I couldn't tell you one memorable WWF Raven promo that wasn't a fucking, like, hilariosity, if I could use a, you know, Stuckman term for a minute. Literally, like, anybody remembers the build-up to Unforgiven 01 and the fucking wood chipper breaking in the middle of the promo and him having to improvise a moppy scream as it goes through? Like, that's just to give you an example. Uh, yeah, but, um, the, yeah, it's a shame. It, this Okay, to put it into simpler terms, I remember Raven as a kid as being the hardcore title guy and considering mm -hmm. where the hardcore title was at that time when I started watching that's not a good thing. So, no. again, we're going to beat that dead horse. They should have mm -hmm. did better with Raven. They, they should have done better, but this is a bright spot in his WWF run for sure. Like I said, yes. freaking violent match, hitting each other with weapons everywhere, false count anywhere, of course, hitting him with the kitchen sink after he misses the gore. Uh, very, very close near falls as well. And you, you'll notice if you watch this match how into it this crowd is. They were buying hook, line, and sinker that either one of these guys could win. No pun intended, of course. Raven goes to pick up another weapon, and Rhino hits a bloody vicious gore on him, nearly breaking him in half to retain the title in a match that only went just a hair over eight minutes. Like It doesn't feel like the match went eight minutes. It could have gone a couple minutes longer, and I, I think it would have been better. Um, I'm going to give this three and a half. Very, very good match. This was fun. This was very, 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 very fun. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Here we go. Oh. In the first ever, the last ever, and the only ever Duchess of Queensberry match. It is William Regal versus Chris Jericho. We talked about it on the WrestleMania podcast, the WrestleMania 17 podcast. Regal and Jericho were in a feud. Uh Jericho got the better of Regal at WrestleMania. And it was all about just Regal just kind of being just oh my god, what's some just being in Jericho's craw throughout this entire feud. And Jericho got, you know, he he peed in his coffee. He peed in his tea. You know, yep. he will pull these little pranks on Regal. And after being embarrassed at WrestleMania, Regal says that you're going to play by my rules now on Backlash, a Duchess of Queensbury rules match. Now I know what you're thinking. What the hell is a Duchess of Queensbury match? I don't think anybody had we any don't know. fucking idea what a Duchess of Queensbury Nobody rules knew. match is. What, Nobody what, knew. Care, care to explain to the viewers what it is? So, in <laughs> order to explain, explain this, one of my favorite match tropes that doesn't even get used that much often, mm -hmm. we got to go back to WCW. I want to say it was 1998, where Lance Storm was the United States champion, but he rechristened it the Canadian title. Yeah, Storm gets pinned in the match. And he says, no, in a Canadian rules match, you get a five count, not a three yep. count. And then he got counted out and said, no, in a Canadian rules match, 
there's a 20 count, not a 10 count. So basically anytime Re- Storm, we're gonna be talking about Regal in a second. Anytime Storm was on the losing end of the match, he would just change the rules into his favor. I mm-hmm. think he made it so there were no count outs, no disqualifications. Um, there were no rope breaks. He just totally curved the match in his favor. So Absolutely. we get the match started. It, it's a pretty standard match. And Jericho goes for the lion's salt. And then the bell rings. Yeah. And every time there's a rule, the Duchess would tell uh, Howard Finkel to mm-hmm. announce the rules. And Howard Finkel says, according to the Queens of Duxbury's rules match, that was the end of the first round. So right when Regal <laughs> was going to lose the match, he broke the momentum by ending the round right then and there. So Jericho couldn't capitalize and get the pin. Yeah. You know, it was That's especially, you know, what was especially funny about that was it seemed like Paul Heyman was the only other person in the building that knew what the Duchess of Queensbury rules actually were. And he's like, knew. yes, <laughs> yes. The first round is over. That's right. Under Duchess of Queensbury rules match, it was performed in rounds. And Paul Heyman was like the know-it-all on commentary. And JR was not buying his bullshit. It was so, so funny. But <laughs> There was that. The match continues. Jericho puts Regal in the walls of Jericho. Regal taps out. The bell yep. rings. The, the Duchess says, no, no, no. In the Duchess of Queensbury match, there are no submissions. You cannot win by submission. And remember, <laughs> this was pre-Judas Effect. This was pre-Code Breaker. This was pre-Breakdown. So that was the only move other than the Lion's Salt that Jericho had. So Jericho's pretty handicapped at this point you when it comes so? to this match. You think so? <laughs> <laughs> he can't win by submission? Well, I mean, like, with an ultimate submission match up next, can you really blame the Duchess for wanting a different finish there? Like, <laughs> so just saying. He's getting with- frustrated. They start wrestling on the outside of the ring, and Regal grabs the Duchess's scepter and mm-hmm. stabs Jericho in the gut with it. The referee uh-huh. rings a bell. Surprise, surprise, there's no disqualifications in a Duchess of Queensbury match. Of course not. Yeah, you know, no disqualifications. You know, in a big gimmick match like this, why would there be disqualifications? So... Um, unless I, I feel like, would, could you imagine if Jericho had grabbed the scepter and then the bell had rung and then according to Duchess yeah. of Queensberry rules, you're a winner by disqualification, <laughs> you know, like if it totally if Jer- 100%, it, it, it's just improvised rules on the fly in commissioner and Regal's I favor. Love that trope so much. The Canadian rules match and the Duchess of Queensberry Queensberry rules match are the only times they've ever done this but I would love to see something like this again. Yeah. I mean, that I would think be it'd be fun. super funny under bloodline rules. Um, you will acknowledge Roman Reigns. <laughs> no. Something like that. Um, again, but... do the 20 count, do the five count in the ring. Do you can't hit somebody with the mm-hmm. kendo stick. If it's the third Sunday in April or something like that, make up like the, like remember SmackDown versus raw 2005. I think it was where yeah. you won the cage match for the world title and William Regal says, no, no, no. According to the rule book, you cannot win the world championship in a steel cage in September. Oh, (laughs) I remember that. I was so fucking pissed as a kid. When I played that story mode, I was like, are you fucking serious? Yeah. (laughs) Then why book a cage match with a world title on a Sunday in September? At Unforgiven, a September show. (laughs) What logic, right? Um, so the finish okay. of the match comes around. Now we get to the fun part. So since there's no disqualifications, the two guys go back into the ring and they start exchanging holds. There's no weapons at this point because there's no disqualifications. Um, Jericho hits an enziguri and then he kicks Regal right in the penis because there's no disqualifications. The bell can't ring. Um, then he goes, finally goes out to the Duchess of Queensberry sitting at ringside, nearly knocks her out of her poor wig and then locks her in the walls of Jericho and Regal hits Jericho over and over with the steel chair and pins him right there in the middle of the ring. And notice how Howard Finkel was like emphasizing in the announcement, according to the Duchess of Queensberry rules, your winner is William Regal. So. <laughs> Man, you know, could have Regal curved the rules more in his favor. He might as well hog tied Jericho's hands and feet together and just rolled him over for the pin right then and there because that's what this match was for Jericho. <laughs> this was so much fun to watch. Yes, and sir. Props to the Duchess for taking the walls because I did my research. 
she is not affiliated with wrestling whatsoever. She no. was just an actor that was brought in. So props no. to her for taking the walls. Absolutely. She, she is a, she's, a, she's a beast in my book. <laughs> Dutch- yeah, props to the Duchess for a perform- job well done. Um, and unless I'm mistaken, look, I was looking at her IMDb credits. I think she was inducted into the Hall of Fame as a part of the Legacy class for 2019. Really? Because she, she is credited under 2019 for the Hall of Fame. No shit, so man. I need to she, look at that. Mu- yeah, she must have gone in for the legacy class because that, that was pretty sick. Because I was I was wow. doing my research trying to figure out if she was like, I heard a rumor. I had like a Mandela effect moment where I was like, isn't she just like one of the producers in drag or something like that? I looked it up. Nope. She was an actor they that WWF brought in and wow. she took a bump. Good for her. <laughs> Good crazy. on Crazy. <laughs> that is crazy. Inducted in the same legacy class as Bruiser Brody, if my memory serves me right. One of the yeah. <laughs> great, one of the wrestling greats. So, mm-hmm. uh, speaking of great wrestling, oh boy. One of the uh, match of the night for me easily was Kurt Angle versus Chris Benoit in a 30-minute ultimate submission match. Ultimate submission matches are never really done in wrestling anymore. This was a popular thing to do in the video games, was turn on an ultimate submission match. Basically, it's an Iron Man match. You can only win by submission, though. That's the only caveat. These I have two never guys... seen, oh, seen such a blood feud when there's not a title on the line. I've never seen a feud more personal. Not like personal because, oh, you hit my wife or, oh, you cost me a title. No, these two, out of the spirit of competition just mm-hmm. did not like each other and it was the most gruesome blood feud i've ever seen in this area era in wwf these it was insane the shit out of each other like in all their matches together like not just in this feud in 2001 like we've talked about so many angle benoit matches yeah. that have been so incredible and this, this was match... not for a title this no. was not for a number one contendership for a title this was not for anything other than the fact that these two just wanted to see who was better than who I mean, how do you call a 30-minute ultimate submission match move for move? I think you it's guys insane. can see the two combatants on the screen right there on the lovely graphic that I'm going to edit in for you. It's uh, it's Kurt Angle and Chris Benoit. They go in there and they have a technical wrestling masterpiece is what this is. And before that, Angle knows what he's getting himself into, <laughs> but he still takes time out of his schedule. He takes time out of his busy training oh, schedule yep. to insult the fans of Chicago. Yeah. Ever since Michael Jordan quit in his prime, rather than play another minute in this town, I've noticed that Chicago was short on winners and a little bit longer on fat, sweaty pigs. <laughs> I'm like, F-. loved it. Loved yep. it, loved it, loved it. Yeah. And then no. he's, he basically says he'll make Benoit squeal like a pig many different times. Um, and you know what? All Technical the submission holds they were pulling. Yeah, all the all the submission holds they were pulling out. Oh, so so good. Benoit was going for the crippler crossface early. Um Kurt was my rolling to the My favorite part of this match is that they were not just depending on the crossface, the sharpshooter and the ankle lock. So many different submission holds were Cross pulled out this breakers. match. Cross arm Cross breakers. Arm breakers, arm bars, uh the half crabs. Uh Yeah, I single sworn... leg motherfucking Boston crab up in here. <laughs> Angle locked in like a weird body scissors abdominal stretch on the floor submission hold there. That that was insane. And that was near like the end of the match too. Like these guys weren't really depending on their submission hold. And I thought that was the coolest thing. It's like the only other thing I could compare it to was in 2010 when John Morrison, The Miz, and Brian Danielson had the submissions count anywhere match. And those guys were pulling out submission holds that weren't the LaBelle lock or you know, the figure four leg lock or anything like that. Right. So just, it's cool when wrestlers, and Danielson's the only other wrestler I could see being able to pull off this kind of match in modern days. Yeah. So to see this, this just variety of submission holds in this match was, you know, when it comes to me, I love tag team matches and I love submissions. So seeing these submissions were so freaking cool. Book it, Tony Khan, Danielson versus Samoa Joe, ultimate submission. Let's go. Um, but fucking hell. man, that someone's would be going to die tonight, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, someone's getting their fucking head kicked in. But um, you, you know what I'm gonna say next, right? One of my favorite tropes in wrestling: they were stealing each other's finishers, 
And that really plays into what I loved most about this match was the layout and the psychology. When Angle was up 2-1, to one, he wanted to embarrass Chris Benoit. So he locks in the Crippler crossface, and Benoit taps out to his own finisher. How humiliating. And then later on in the match, to tie up the score, Benoit locks Kurt in the ankle lock, and Kurt taps to that. So... So these two are as even as evenly possible as you could ever possibly get in your life. And in true, okay, in any other instance, I would call this cliche, but considering how neck and neck, no pun intended, this match oh, was God. this angle locks on the ankle lock. Benoit is the only smart wrestler I've ever seen do this. He sees that there's only 10 seconds on the clock. And he's not like Sasha Banks and taps out at three seconds. He nope. hangs in there. He takes and the, the bell rings. And it's a, going to be called a draw. But thankfully, the referee isn't a dumbass. And he tells Howard Finkel, we are now going into sudden death rules. The next fall and is going to, or the next submission is going to win the match. And Angle is livid. He is not happy that this match is going to mm -hmm. continue. He was easily going to take the draw at this point easily Ooh. was happy to walk out with the draw just like he did at uh, Raw Homecoming against Shawn Michaels. He just walked out of the arena. The crowd was pissed, but thankfully we got a decisive winner here, and that winner was the one I thought should have won at Mania X7, Chris Benoit, because he needed the win more than Kurt did to really elevate Benoit to that next level. Kurt had already been the WWF champion. Uh, he, he hadn't won the championship multiple times at this point. No, it was, it was just the one time. But, but considering Benoit, where Benoit, Benoit was, win. he needed it. Yes. He needed it. He needed it. He needed it. Yeah, and he made Angle tap out to the move that started this all in the first place, the Crippler crossface. And Benoit wins. The crowd in Chicago loves it. Um, Five stars? Yeah. Yeah. Five I think stars. So. I think so. Because right, this man. was – here's the thing. If it would have ended at a draw, I would have left it at four and three quarter. But since this, they rectified that, five star. This match is not their best match. Um, that still is held by Royal Rumble 2003 in my book, but I think this is the, their second best. And you want to know why? Ultimate submission match is very difficult to pull off. An Iron it Man is. match. Iron Man matches are very, very difficult to pull off. And these two guys went out there and they told a fantastic story for 30 straight minutes, more than 30 minutes with the overtime in there. And the crowd was into Absolutely. it the opening bell. Uh, there's a difference between... Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels, WrestleMania 12, and John Cena, Randy Orton, Bragging Rights 2009. Nothing against Cena and Orton. Let me get that out of the way now. But the difference is, is that Cena and Orton in their Iron Man match were slowly, methodically going through that and taking spots where they could take a lot of rest breaks. Something like Bret and Shawn, something like Angle and Benoit, they're wrestling that entire 60 minutes, mm -hmm. that entire 30 minutes. And in my opinion, that's, the dif that's what differences me from a good Iron Man match to a, a decent one. I don't want to say Cena or it's bad, but yeah. a decent one. Something well, that doesn't really it, measure up. And this match also was not ruined by the <clears throat> crowd counting down to 23 solid minutes in Dolph Ziggler and Seth Rollins. Wasn't yeah. ruined by those people <laughs> who are fucking tired and wanted to hijack the match. But um, yeah. it's, you know, this was a freaking awesome Iron Man match. I recommend this is a hidden gem. Definitely check this one out. Like I said, still not Angle and Benoit's best match. I tell by Royal Rumble 2003. It probably always will be for me. Um, but this match told a great story. It had the right winner in my book. Say what you want about well, Benoit now. Saying but it's, that Benoit, yeah. it's not Benoit Angle's best match. That's like comparing a plate of filet mignon and a plate of filet mignon that just needs a little bit of salt. Yeah. They're still excellent. <laughs> oh, excellent totally. to the nth degree. Oh, that's not even my favorite cut of the steak, but yeah, I'll, I'll take your, uh, yeah, I, I got gotcha. you. I get what you're saying, but for sure, for sure. <sighs> it's time. Are you ready? No. Are you ready? No, I'm not. It's time for the greatest match concept in all of professional wrestling. We have the big show versus Shane McMahon in a last man standing match. <laughs> How did we get you, here? I will tell you. Do you followers like seeing me tortured? Do you like seeing Tomas torture me like this? Huh? 
Is that it? <laughs> we can do more last man standing matches. Just wait in a couple years when we do Edge versus Benoit on a last man standing match. Yeah, just, just wait, wait until just wait until next month when we do Triple H and Shawn Michaels at Royal Rumble 04. Ah, one of my favorite matches. <laughs> no, no. Anywho. <laughs> that match ended in a draw, you asshole. <laughs> How did we get here? So after Shane defeated his father, Vince, in a very good no disqualification match at WrestleMania 17, the buyout has happened. We're all, we're kind of planting the seeds toward the invasion. And basically Vince and Shane have a big show in the ring and they say, whose side do you want to be on? WCW or WWF? That's a stupid argument. They're all owned by the same company. Yeah. That's like saying, which dressing room do you want to be in? This one or the one that's, six feet that way <laughs> do you want to do you want to belong to marvel or star wars basically at this point <laughs> under the six disney's umbrella. holding a big like monopoly over the entertainment world and like you know it's like trying to pick like i mean ideally as an actor i'd want to be in both so i mean that'd be cool so but... big show in the many turns that he does in his career pretend he's gonna go with shane but then he immediately choke slams Shane. He aligns himself with Vince. That's not what we're talking about. That's not the important part of the feud, though. Because the important part of the feud the is nursery Shane rhyme. and the Beanstalk. Shane and the Beanstalk. The Thursday before this, Shane is sitting backstage with literally a hardcover children's book like you would find in an elementary school library. He literally just crossed out Jack with a Sharpie and wrote in Shane. And the big, the big motto of that nursery rhyme, of course... Which way did he go? Where did he go? Which, Which way, way did, did he, he go? go? You know, that was basically just making fun of Big Show. Uh, when I Shane don't know McMahon, rhyme. this is when Shane McMahon was actually entertaining and uh, people actually got behind his character and he was endearing and not ruining the men's Royal Rumble. But uh, it's, yeah, uh, yeah, I don't know this nursery rhyme word for word, but it's pretty iconic. Go look it up. But if you ever hear people saying, Which way did he go? Which way did he go? That's where that came from. It came from mm -hmm. Shane and Big Show. And the fans were really into it to the point that if you looked in the audience, tons of signs saying which way did he go? Shane and the Shane and the Beanstalk. Down goes the giant. They were really into this gimmick for mm -hmm. whatever reason. Also, for whatever reason, if say what you want about Shane. I miss the custom jerseys. I, uh, I mean, he still sort of does them, but they don't have all the mottos on the back. Like they're just giant like killer. My favorite, yeah. Backlash 2009, the money, the game, the animal, the end of legacy. He'll yeah. never do something like that ever again. That was the best one. No, no, not at all. Not at all. But uh, so the match begins and Shane is being chased by the giant all over the place. And you already see my problem here. Big Show knocks Shane McMahon down once and he says, count him. And I'm like, fucking pin him, please. You know, because no, the near falls will no, be more God. exciting. No, because Big Show needs to give more punishment to Shane McMahon to make sure he stays Yeah, because the fucker count, picks him up at eight. Count. Like, and you have to fucking wait for that. Like, you know, like, you just we'll get to that. a few seconds. We'll, we'll get to that. So Big Show is chasing Shane around the ring. That's Shane's MO in this match is just to basically Which way get away from go? the Big Show and just, like, get him with, like, long-range offense. Because yeah. he's running away from him. He's running up the steps. He's going under the ring. He goes under the ring. He pulls out a kendo stick. He yeah. starts walloping Big Show with this kendo While stick. While the Big Show is looking under the ring, Shane pops out from uh, the other side with a kendo stick in hand and hits Big Show right in the ass with it. So it's... So there's going to be a lot of dumbass yeah. moments, in my opinion, in this match. Oh, so Shane, fuck. he has the upper hand. Yeah. So what does he do? He climbs to the top of the barricade, and you know when you jump at a big guy, it's never gonna go right. No. He goes at and he gets palmed right out of the air. Just like oh. you were doing so fine, Shane, until you decided to create distance and jump off of something. Swatted like With a little gnat. Jump off something. Well, we're we're not there yet, but let's talk about the chloroform real quick. So Big Show has. Did you just say chloroform? Yeah, the chloroform like liquid. Okay. What oh, the so hell is that going. smell? <laughs> so Shane pulls out a surgical mask and he pulls out a bottle and he pulls yeah. out a cloth. You know, anybody who's seen any sort of horror movie knows where this is going. It's a cliche right. in movies at this point. At it's least, honestly, uh, it's a cliche to the point where it's an inaccurate cliche. 
Because I've actually read up that if you try to chloroform somebody, it actually takes a couple of minutes for it to kick in and it doesn't go instant like movies and TV make it out to yeah. be. At least Shane uh, at least Shane has proper PPE that's being used. So you know but and he's not an anti masker like spot? some other uh, never mind. <laughs> what's my issue with this spot? Uh, ahead, you know what I'm talking about? What's my what, issue with uh, this spot? Paul. Paul, you, do you smell that? What is that? Is Commentators that... are acting like they've never smelled or heard or seen ethanol before they've never seen chloroform before they've never had an ipa you know here's your, your thing you're right shane was protecting him protecting himself fuck everybody else in the match though fuck the referee fuck the fuck people everybody sitting else in the, in the arena row. fuck, fuck all the fans. everybody else we're gonna pull out this dangerous flammable liquid because shane wants to gas the big show yeah and here's the thing in that in that aspect that was really smart have you ever mm-hmm. seen anybody try that before in wrestling Trying yeah. to gas somebody. Only in the worst <laughs> stipulation match of all time do you see something like so, that, for sure. So, here's the thing. that I really hope that was, like, water or something, because if Big Show actually had to inhale that shit, there would be a lot. Well, here's the... Okay, we're talking well, about the same man who legit took a tranquilizer dart. I was just about to say, we're going to get to that <laughs> at, at some point next year when we do 2004. So, um, Big Show has, if you know... Big Show Big is willing to take done a worse. tranquilizer dart. I think he wouldn't be opposed to taking a little bit of chloroform. But Shane is just smothering the Big Show with this cloth. And it's working. Big Show is out. And at this point, honestly, WWE actually does a logical thing. And this match should be over. But Vince McMahon comes out. And he stops Shane. damn interference. He, He gets Shane off of Big Show. And he starts beating him with the chair. And to be fair, that is enough to distract the referee from the count so big show was able to wear off that chloroform but, but, and big show's able to get up but why do you need to distract the referee in a no dq match like well i mean if the referee's <laughs> attention isn't on counting then yeah you do need to distract the referee right yeah but it's no disqualification so you shouldn't need to right <laughs> you know? no no no. i get what you're saying it's not like he's breaking any rules behind the referee's back it's just that the referee's not attention isn't where it's supposed to be that's like in it's a false count anywhere match it's his fucking company he made the rules the false count anywhere match if you knock out the referee the referee's still not conscious to make the count you didn't yeah. need to do that but i'm just trying to justify a last man standing at the here okay <laughs> yeah yeah i'm clearly a stickler for details and you see why i hate this match so so um, big show is up and he has the upper hand now he choke slams shane and i will agree i did not like this spot at all big show has the match won but at eight he lifts shane back up and you had to make win the match first and then choke slam him off the empire state building for all i care win yeah. the match first yeah so uh fucking wait 15 seconds for that near fall before you get to that spot you know like if it were just a normal match you would only have to wait two seconds Let's spare me but, some I mean, time, please. <laughs> it's climactic. No. You gotta see if he's gonna get up from the 10 count. So Bullshit. Big Show choke slams him again. And then he picks him up again. Dude, the a commentators boxing... try to justify this. This is not a boxing match, though, and a boxing match count is way quicker than this. Like <laughs> the commentators try to justify this by saying it's not about winning the match, then why you win the match. It's about punishing Shane. Win the match, and then again. Choke slam him off the Golden Gate Bridge for all I care. Yeah, and chuck him first. off of the set. He was going to do that anyway. So, And then my biggest, you know what? The more I talk about this match, I realize how not very good it was. Thank you. Because who comes in next? Test. Yeah, yeah. It's a test. Yeah, it's a test. So yeah. I will admit, no music. Test was probably in the prime of his career at this point. He had just coming off of being the chosen one, uh, feuding with Triple H. He's finally on the right track with his babyface run. He's interfering in this match because Big Show attacked him, apparently. He was just one of Big Show's victims. So Tess felt the need to, oh, JR tried to justify this by saying, well, Tess and Shane used to be brother-in-law, brother-in-laws. But they were fighting. Do you remember the fucking Greenwich Street fight, JR? You called that thing. They fucking hated each other. <laughs> if I had an ex-brother-in-law, 
I'm sorry, I wouldn't be friends with him. <laughs> no. <laughs> but I, I wouldn't have been connected to that family at all. You see? Yeah, so <laughs> like, come that's on. a weird justification. And this is where the match falls apart for me, falls apart for me, because it turns into test versus big show. I understand mm -hmm. Tess wanting to even up the odds because Vince interfered earlier. But if he were to do that, he would hit Big Show with the big boot and then Tess would be out of there. Tess mm -hmm. is here for the remainder of this match. Yeah, it turns into a handicap match, literally, um, in favor of the baby faces. So it's it's you see why you see why I'm annoyed, right? You know, you want to take is, this match home. I can. I can. So Tess and the all three of these guys fight to the entranceway. Tess puts Big Show on a crash pad box-like structure, and he looks up to the heavens, and Shane has climbed all the way to the top of this fucking set. The fucking lunatic and is all the way up there. Why, honestly, Big Show is chasing Shane, and he finds refuge on this structure, on the set structure, and Which Tess way did he is go? still fighting Big Show. Exactly, yeah. This is the whole big climax of this match, and it's weird because Tess... He he doesn't incapacitate Big Show. He's just like holding him down. Yeah. And then he sees Shane and he goes, jump. And Shane goes, and just fucking jump. And then the Shane, iconic Shane does the thing and then he fucking jumps off the set, which is which is given a replay treatment like at least six more times throughout the duration of this pay per view. Um and Tess basically props Shane up on the camera crane. So Shane is the last man standing. Wins by the match yeah, by technicality, and Tess carries his ex brother in law out of the arena. And Big Show, okay, the loser, just thoughts, lays on the crash pad. Before we get into the, our final thoughts of this match, let me just say crash pad or no crash pad, that was probably the most dangerous stunt I've ever seen Shane pull. Yeah. More dangerous oh, than Alan Estelle. 32. For the love wood, of mankind! <laughs> fuck you, Mike. Well, no, Shane's jump from 32. Right, no, that that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Oh yeah, yeah. you're right. That's the, yeah, I thought you were playing Michael Cole's I'm like, the most forced contrived call of all time. Um, and because let me tell you, yeah, crash pad or no crash pad, wood fucking flew after it that hurt. spot. That sounded like it hurt for sure. Yeah, um, and Shane probably connected three percent of his body on a big show. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. looked fucking nasty. And Big Show fucking nasty. And Big Show was the loser. Apparently, he didn't get up from that after Shane missed him. You know. <laughs> See, and that was such innovative creativity from Tess to prop Shane up on that camera crane, yeah. so Shane could be creative finish. the last man standing. Creative finish. Fantastic match. I'm kidding. This wasn't a fantastic match. <laughs> no, it wasn't. I honestly can't give it more than two and a half. I. Uh, I I'm going to pull a Chris Lash and give it a two, and that's being generous. Um, like, this match was silly. It was this match, fucking silly. This match was just built around the spot, and that's all it was. Yeah. Um, it was an a, iconic spot. It's a memorable but spot. The, but the road to get to that spot was silly. It was, yeah. A little, little bit ridiculous, huh? A little bit, yeah. Just a little. I think they should stop doing last man standing matches, but I know they're not going to. Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Anymore. Just, hope we get one out of. Uh, hope we get one at Hell in a Cell as much as that makes sense. No, no, it, it doesn't make any fucking sense. Put Last Man Standing match inside Hell in a Cell, just like you put an I Quit match in there. Why don't you? <laughs> um, Last Man Standing match at Clash at the Castle. Can't oh, wait. God, no. Yeah, Clash at the Castle is going to be a great show. Speaking of Europe, we Last Man Standing. what a segue, right? You mentioned the European pay per view. We're going to talk about Perfect a timing. European title match. <laughs> um, it's Matt Hardy, the new champion, who won it literally the last episode of SmackDown. The Fink announces him as the new European champion as he comes out. Um, he's defending against Christian and former champion Eddie Guerrero. Um, this match only got seven minutes. The crowd was not into this because they just saw a man leap from 30 feet in the air to uh, hit 3% of the big show. But this was, you know, they thousand moves a minute you know yeah don't really um, have anything... i don't like that okay you know me i don't like matches that are thrown together at the last second with no build and this felt like three severed pieces of a tag team just fighting for a pointless belt but i like this 
This was yeah. fun. So yeah, what we was, had, it was, was cool. Good, some good wrestling on the on the match for sure. Um, there was some nice hurricane. Not necessary sure. interference, but then again, there's three severed parts but of the tag team least, in this match. But why would they not interfere? At least they're partners now. You know, like it's not like Tess and Shane who weren't partners at all. At oh yeah, at least it was two lives. brothers helping two brothers. Mm-hmm. Well, Edge and Christian aren't even brothers, right? They're they basically brothers. are in my heart. Kayfabe brothers. <laughs> They're brothers but... in my heart, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just pulling your leg. Um, <laughs> I mean, you're not really going to remember a ton about this thing. Edge runs interference. Jeff Hardy basically runs interference. Christian hits a kill switch on Eddie Guerrero. Jeff Hardy hits a swanton on Christian. Um, Jeff misses a lot of him because... Uh, you know, I'm seeing why Tomas doesn't like Jeff Hardy because uh, he botches a lot. Um, so Matt Hardy hits a twist of fate on Christian, pins him at about the seven minute mark. Definitely very fast paced, definitely very exciting, but you're not going to remember this tomorrow. Um, I mean, no, no, give it three. Stars. Honestly, this I mean, is they a match hard. they could have stayed for Raw. Yeah, they worked hard. It was they fine, could've... you know. Yeah, nothing but wrong then again, to say about it. We have a really, really, really big match coming up that was already longer than it needed to be. The mm -hmm. last thing we needed it for it to be even longer and the crowd not being into it. Yeah. All right. We alluded to it. Here we go. I'm going to explain this match before I say what it is. Like I said, Austin's the WWF champion. He Triple sure H is. had just won the Intercontinental title. In any other sense of the word, I this match was thrown together by a bunch of randomness, but at the same time, how else do you get to this point? Triple H had just won the Intercontinental title, and now they're, they are continuing their feud with the Brothers of Destruction. Uh, Vince McMahon tells the Brothers of Destruction, you want to face Triple H and Stone Cold Steve Austin? Well, beat Edge and Christian, the tag team champions, and you will get that shot. So the Brothers of Destruction win the titles. They're the tag team champions. Triple H and Stone Cold are the WWF Intercontinental champion. And Vince actually makes a smart move, something yeah. that he's not really known for doing. He says, you guys you want to fight say. a backlash? Fine. But the titles have to be on the line. And Triple H said, sure, I want the tag team titles. And Vince says, no, all of the titles are going to be on the line. Yep. So this is the ultimate power struggle. The Brothers of Destruction, Triple H and Stone Cold Steve Austin, winner take all. Yep. The WWF Championship, the Intercontinental Championship, the world tag team titles, all of it's on the line. I feel like Backlash is theme, especially this time right now, is title unification. They want all the fucking titles on one person. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that's not happening anymore with, uh, you know, RK Bro and the Usos not being for all the tag team titles anymore and it's turning into oh, a six-man tag because uh, they came to their senses about the brand split and Roman Reigns is holding two titles and it's not just one. But um, this match was 25 minutes, which is, you know, typical for a match of this period, a main event to go like this, very methodically paced. Um, it was fine. So you know, it was fine. considering this is a main event <laughs> tag team match, I've noticed this is a case with a lot of main event tag team matches because tag team matches are structured a lot differently than one-on-one -on -one matches. This is how I kind of split up this match. Chaos in the beginning, then they needed to settle down. Taker took the heat, and then it got crazy again, but then Kane had to take the heat, and then it got crazy again. So it was a marathon, to say the least. The first yeah. section of this story was Kane was injured at the hands of Triple H and Stone Cold, That's and right. Taker yep. refused to tag Kane in because he didn't want his brother's shoulder to hurt more than it actually did. Every single time Taker got some offense, Kane would hold out his hand, and Taker would go, nope your shoulder. I'm not tagging you in. Yeah, so Taker so, was fighting a lot of this match by himself. And therein lies my problem with this match. That was the only source of tension between the Brothers of Destruction. I don't think that should have been the only source of tension because think about it. So, not to discredit the Intercontinental title more than it already is these days. Uh, God bless Ricochet's heart. But Undertaker was not tagging Kane in because he was concerned about his injury. Um, one of those guys could pin Stone Cold Steve Austin and become the WWF champion. Like, how did they decide who got which title if the brothers won? That you know? was not even a point that they even brought up. That could have been a good, like, 
source of tension. I agree with you. That wasn't even brought up. Honestly, never addressed. The Brothers of Destruction motive was just taking down Austin and Triple H for their own. This was two one on one. Not even to views. win the world heavyweight title. Here's like, the thing. Imagine if this main event got broken up into two separate main events: Kane versus Triple H for the Intercontinental Title, and Stone Cold versus the Undertaker for the WWF Championship. Well, and that's that's exactly what they did the next month at Judgment Day. And you know what? It worked a million times better than this did. Um, exactly, Austin versus yeah. Undertaker wrestled a no holds barred match that night, and this is a Sacramento pay per view, so this is right up your alley. Um, Stone Cold and Taker had a really, really brutal main event. Triple H and Kane wrestled in a chain match for the IC title where Kane actually won. So that, that formula worked a lot better than this. Um, exactly. And we will get into why we feel like this match happened at the end, but, uh, this match is, it's a marathon. I will admit I got tired watching this match. It wasn't a bad match whatsoever. No. But when a tag team match is your main event. <laughs> You kind of have to stretch it out more, and it's a lot different than a one-on-one, -on -one, you know, where both guys can go back and forth. You know the tag team formula. One guy's got to take the heat, and Taker and Kane took a lot of heat before we got to the conclusion of this match. They sure did. They sure did. Um, Undertaker, of course, you know, he's getting the hot tag. He's running wild on the two heels who had been reluctant throughout the whole match to get into the ring with these guys. Just seeing Stone Cold in the heel role after so long, he had asked to turn heel because he felt like his character was getting stale. And they just made him such a coward. They made him such a coward. It was so Ryan weird. Ryan Zane put it best when he was talking about Stone Cold's worst moments. The moment of Austin turning heel, absolutely memorable and executed to perfection. The mm -hmm. execution of his heel run, not done well whatsoever. No. And it started as early as this pay-per-view. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, some good near falls throughout the match. Kane is hitting into Gurry's. You know, it's Kane hit a really good into Gurry. Give the man credit where it's due. Hitting the choke slam on Austin. Um, Taker's hitting choke slams everywhere. Taker and Hunter are in the ring together, revisiting their Mania X7 classic. Taker hits Hunter with the last ride. The last ride. <laughs> and, you know, they continue. <laughs> <laughs> of course, you got to just bring it reference in there. You know, you're welcome, viewers. Um, Kane, Kane and Hunter are the legal guys. Getting towards the end now. Taker and Austin are brawling on the outside. <clears throat> Stephanie tries to run interference. I, I didn't even mention that Stephanie was at ringside the entire time going out with the uh, with the Intercontinental Champion. Uh she tries to bring in a sledgehammer, I believe, and attack Kane with it while the referee is down. Kane I like how Kane with... doesn't fucking hesitate to just boot her in the face. Kane did not even fucking hesitate to boot Stephanie in the face. And why should he? He's a fucking demon from hell. You know, he, like, having, like, sensitive Kane in there, you know. I hate this moral debate that wrestlers have when like you know the heel female manager comes in and like do i do it do i do it no kane literally just turned around without hesitation bah, right in her jaw of course you do it right of course you nose. do it yeah <laughs> uh, so that of course triggers stephanie's dear old dad vince mcmahon and he runs down to the also, ring with a sledgehammer stone cold and taker they're brawling in the audience at this point this match oh, is yeah. totally broken down oh yeah oh yeah they're gone they're gone that plays into the finish for sure. Yeah. Because an, an injured Kane who's got a bum arm is left all alone in the ring with the cerebral assassin. Not necessarily because Steph tried to run interference. Then Vince runs interference. Uh, Triple H Again. then. Yeah. And then hits him with the sledgehammer. Triple H then nails one a pedigree on Kane. And then after, what, 25 straight minutes, Vince throws Earl Hebner back in the ring. The result was never in any doubt when this match was announced. There's new World Wrestling Federation Tag Team Champions. The video package at the beginning summed it up. He who has the gold has the power. He who has the power has the gold. And that gold belonged to the two-man power trip after this. Yep, Triple H and Stone Cold were christened the two-man power trip. This was supposed to go into a very, very long run for Austin and Triple H with all of the titles. This would not last long whatsoever. This was made for the no. moment and the moment only. Like we alluded well, to, Triple H lost the Intercontinental title at Judgment Day, and mm -hmm. then he would go down with the injury, the infamous injury on an episode of Raw against in Jericho San Jose. and Benoit in San Jose. 
and Taurus Quad in San Jose, just right up my alley. But uh, yeah, that um, was a so classic the match was on Raw. Pretty soon, yeah. This lasted. Mm. I wanted the two man power trip lasted what all of three months. We did get some good matches out of there. We mm. did get you know good matches with Jericho. We got some good matches with Benoit. We got a good match between Triple H and Jeff Hardy on an episode of SmackDown that yeah. not a lot of people talk about. Um, you know, this wasn't all bad. We got some good matches out of it, but for this moment, it was here, but it all, I feel like all started falling apart. Like literally the next month at judgment day mm. and with triple H going down with Austin skill turn, not going so well, all the titles had to be taken off of them. And it was just, a, I don't want to call it a dumpster fire, but a failed experiment. Could you imagine what would have happened if triple H had never tore his quad in 2001? It's if one WWE of the had a what if, if series like Marvel did, that would be probably its pilot episode. What if Triple H never tore his quad? Yeah, he would probably be, you know, him and Austin would probably feud with the uh, roles reversed. Uh, I don't know. I don't know, man. It's really, really hard to tell. But for what it um, was, three My stars, favorite part three of stars. the aftermath of this match was JR because uh, he was just going on and on and on about – Oh, they have all the titles, but the Undertaker, Undertaker is going to want some revenge. And I think my favorite line he said was, they may have all the gold, but as long as the Undertaker is breathing, there's going to be a beating in store for Stone Cold and Triple H. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> fucking love JR. Just fucking disregard Kane, the man who got pinned, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> basically, you know. Um, I mean, it's a hard match to rate just because the match dragged on a lot. It's a long, long main event, but I feel like it got especially exciting towards the end. A lot of, a lot of really high stakes brawling there. You certainly felt the stakes with three titles on the line. Um, but I just feel like if you shave 10 minutes off the match, it would have had a much more compact tight pace to it. Um, oh, yeah. but other than that, I mean, good wrestling on this show. I can't really complain too much about Backlash 2001. You have a classic Ultimate Submission match, an iconic spot at the end of a shitty stipulation. Um, I'm going to give it an 8. I'm going to give it an 8. This is a very entertaining pay-per-view, I thought. Yeah, I think this pay-per-view, I feel like a lot of Attitude Era pay-per-views have a lot of unnecessary fluff, a lot of matches that you really don't care for. But <laughs> Last Man Standing. Solid Solid opener, really underrated hardcore title match, yeah. and then Love a fun gimmick match. match, a fantastic ultimate submission match, a last man standing match with a good moment, mm -hmm. um, a filler European title match, which was harmless at worst, and mm -hmm. a pretty solid main event, all things considered. You know, half the match or eight. They could have yeah. added some stupid stuff on this pay-per-view, but they didn't. They really could have. They really could have, man, but... Uh... You know, this is certainly not the last retro poll we're going to be doing. These are too fun. Uh, definitely stay tuned for some more uh, down the line. We're, of course, going to wrap up the year 2003 very, very soon with a very, very shitty show indeed with Armageddon. Um, we also, of course, have WrestleMania Backlash this weekend this year, headlined by Cody Rhodes and Seth Rollins. Uh, the I Quit match between Charlotte and Ronda. Uh, and then a really, really crazy six-man tag as well, of course. Um but other than that, yeah, we got double or nothing at the end of the month. How could you forget? Hangman Page versus Tomas's favorite uh, future AEW champion, CM Punk. Um, <laughs> oh, we can't wait to talk about that. Um, but definitely consider smashing the subscribe button. Hit that thumbs up if you haven't already. Um, stay tuned for more ZNT Wrestling Show nonsense from here on, my friends. And uh, Commence that back talk. Let us know what you thought of Backlash 2001. What would you like to hear us talk about on this show? Because honestly, your feedback is much, much appreciated. Your votes are so, so awesome. Seeing those, you know, like seeing your feedback. It's, you know, it's really, really interesting to see what shows come up for sure. But uh, yeah, my friends, see you guys for the next one. Stay tuned. Yeah.